is this your first Noob Spirit podcast episode? Well, if it is, I'm going to pop your Noob Spirit podcast cherry in style today with my good buddy, Tony Alcock, a.k.a. Taz Yance. We have a magic chat. If you're new here, the Noob Spirit podcast is interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities, and characters from around the world. My name's Isaac or Shrek, and I am the lucky bugger that gets to chat with these legends all, all the time. And I still love it and absolutely froth on it. Today's guest, Taz Yarns, has his own podcast. Um, check it out, Taz Yarns. Going live today is an interview that I did with Tony on his podcast. And uh, but Tony's just down to earth, super cool style. You're gonna you're gonna really enjoy um, his podcast, particularly if you like the new spirit. Um, what does Tony do? He loves BJJ, surfing, he raps, sings, plays guitar. And I guess one of my most favourite things is he's a he's a banana farmer in North Queensland. He's been spearing for about 30 years and uh, only really recently in the last couple of years has he progressed beyond 10 metres because they're pretty spoiled up there. They can they can spear a lot of good fish in shallow water. But we talk about the North Queensland lifestyle. We get pleasantly diverted on lots of different trains of thought and it's a good old chat. I've got a longer intro coming up today, but I've got a few things that I really want to share with you. Some massive things that have happened in the spearing community and it's not... Or beer and skittles, unfortunately. Um, I'd also encourage you to hang around to the end of today's episode. Jordan left me a crack of voicemail. You can leave one at noobspirit.com. Go up to the Noob Story section and uh, leave your own story. Today, it's Jordan's cautionary tale. It's uh, it's a little comical, uh, but there's definitely some solid, actionable lessons learned, and I'd encourage you. That'll be at the back end of today's episode. If it's a longer voicemail you leave me, I tend to punch them on the back of the episode. So, um, uh, that way... People can hang around, listen to them, and they're not too disruptive on the show because they're already a long enough intro, so sorry for that. Um, look, ha- happening in the community, there's been a number of uh, of sad of sad things that have happened. Three absolute champions have passed from us. I want to quickly highlight them. Jacksonville diver, Timothy Obie, he's a father of three. Um, earlier this week, uh, Obie's gear was found by volunteers assisting in the massive search effort for him. Um, he was last seen by friends spearing and his body was uh, was not recovered. Also, uh, another body not recovered was the body of Arctic freediver, Brisbane diver, but originally from Norway, uh, Didrik Hurum. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is at Arctic underscore freediver on Instagram. Post some, he posted some absolutely magical dives um, and uh, he's a gun bloke and, and really popular dude as well. He was last seen doing a drop off the back of a very uh, popular deep reef off Brisbane here. I'm, I'm not going to go into specifics on this, but a friend of this had to say the other day following off a send-off they did on the Gold Coast, he said the number and diversity of people that travelled to see you off today is a testament to the effect you had on everyone you met. You were a true gentleman of the sea um, so touching words there for um, Didrick but yeah also John Dornellis aka the reef hunter uh, prolific underwater photographer uh, really popular US diver just a, a real clever dude and, and the way he looked at and perceived and, and, and took photos and stuff he's also left us uh, unfortunately there's a send off on August the 6th for friends and family of uh, Michael, the reef hunter, Dawn Ellis. Um, check that out. Um, I'll leave you to find that information on Facebook. Uh, I believe it's for people that, that knew him personally, but uh, if you want to go and be a part of that, then please do so. So some sadder news today, guys, and, um, you know, the reality of our sport, sometimes these guys and girls are taken too early from us. So, yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh Apologies if I was a bit sad there with that, um, but it's some of these, particularly the Arctic freediver one, really rocked me uh, on a on a personal level. And and, and um, yeah. Anyway, on another note, ninety nine Spiro recipes, the crowdsourced recipe book that a noob Spiro is putting together is roaring along. It is absolutely doing phenomenally. I think we've got more than forty five recipes submitted so far. They're coming in. The, the quality of some of the submissions is absolutely phenomenal. Um, really encourage you to, if you particularly if you've got really good photos, submit your recipes because um, this book is going to be a treasure chest of actionable meals for the spearfishing community. Um, get beyond your comfort zone. Those three to four recipes that you smash, by, by all means, submit those recipes for the book. But this book will give you access to, you know, recipes from legends from all over the place just the premises on action 
actionable, simple meals for the everyday diver. So check that out, noobspero.com forward slash submit recipe and get your recipe in the book. Um, Last thing before we hook in to today's episode, a quick review from Trav. He says, great listen, some easy listening about your favorite way to catch fish. What's even better is the content. It's all very knowledgeable and will help you finding, filming, hunting all the way to caring and cleaning for your catch so thanks trav awesome review let's get into today's interview with tony alcock aka taz yans here we go today's new spear podcast is proudly brought to you in partnership with adreno spearfishing supplies for your next piece of spearfishing equipment head to adreno.com.au flat rate shipping australia-wide huge range of gear save twenty dollars on every purchase over 200 when you use the code noob Spiro. better yet drop into their brisbane sydney melbourne or perth mega stores use the code noob Spiro to save online or in store check it out adreno.com.au Today's Noob Spirit podcast is brought to you by Neptonics.com. For US divers, Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all of your spearfishing essentials. They've got free shipping on every order over $99. Now you can use the Noob10 code to save 10% off anything and everything store-wide. 10% off store-wide. Use the code Noob10 at Neptonics.com. Boom. G'day, neighbors. Uh I'm joined by Taz, aka Tony, aka All Cock, because he's 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 well he's well endowed, the gentleman. Um, no, not even. <laughs> but Taz, I've been listening to Taz's podcast that he used to do with um, As from uh, Back to Basics. So it was um, what was it? As and Taz Yarns or yeah, Yarns with As and Taz. Yarns with As and Taz, and now yeah. it's Taz Yarns. Yeah, we're not going to stray too far from the, the old name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, why? Why? It's a bloody good thing. And um, you're on the eastern seaboard of Australia here, same as me, but you're quite a way north and enjoying a Queensland winter by the sounds of it. Yeah, so I just had to put the air con on because the room was getting a bit hot. <laughs> um, it's plus because in the background, you, you just can't see it, but we've um, I've got a tropical feel behind me. Tropical feel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on an island. Uh, my 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 um, virtual background's going fantastic too. It's quite distracting. Um, we 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 warmed up this conversation, Tony, chatting about boats. And um, I mean, I, I want to chat a little bit more about boats as as we as we move on. But um, tell everyone that's not familiar with you a little bit about yourself. Yep. Well, I'm just a shitty banana farmer from North Queensland that likes spear and fishing and doing all the outdoor stuff. And uh, over the years, I've started my own podcast and um, was a musician. And I fear. What do you mean? Few- what do you mean? Was a musician? You're still a bloody good musician. I listen to your, I listen to your bloody Yahoo sessions every week on Instagram. And uh, um, you actually played a ripper of a song. It was a, um, was it plush or it was a Stone Temple Pilots number? Oh, yeah. that was a while back. Yeah, I think it did plush. Hey, you did a ripper rendition. I was like, that's friggin' legit. Like you, oh, you got yeah, skills, mate. yeah, yeah, and you yeah. like rapping too, like a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I used to be in a band called Zilch, and then uh, we recorded with that, that for a couple of albums and or EPs we call it, and then moved across and did left that and became a hip hop artist. Shit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just one of the stupid things I thought I'd do, mate. You, you, you do. Remind me, like, you're just one of those interesting characters that likes just heaps of different shit. Like, you're also into jiu-jitsu and, uh, and it's, it's, it's crazy, the life you've led. Yeah, I just think give everything a go and see what sticks. Uh, how old are you? Uh, really old? No, I'm 42. Oh, you got a couple of years on me, so. Yeah, I heard that the other day. You are saying something on your podcast, you're 39 or something. Yeah, I turned 40 this year. Yeah, yeah. I'm old too, man. Big yeah. party this year. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> how long? How long did? How long have you been sparing? Uh, me, thirty years since I was about twelve, I reckon. Holy uh, shit. Yeah, it doesn't mean I'm good at it. I, I've just yeah. pretty much self-taught up until I met As. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. everything I learned before that was just mates and self-taught. I didn't really, I never even really looked up YouTube or anything on how to spear. It was just just went out and did it, just second nature sort of thing. So, so what the family was into it? Yeah, well, my there. my old man 
and my brother, my brother does a little bit of spearing. My old man just went out fishing a fair bit. And then I just, you, some days you're out there and it's just like 20 meters deep and you can see the bottom. And I'm just like, oh, I want to know what's down there. And I'm like, you yeah. can see what's going on, but I, I want to be a part of it. Yeah. And yeah, and it's just, it just grew from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Once you're, once you're out there and once you stick your head under that water, it's just, well, I even if it's, even if it's not very fishy, there's still shit to see, and you're swimming around. There's yeah. exercise involved, and like yeah. the worst thing for me about line fishing, like guys that are good at it, they geek out on it and they love all the stuff and all that. And I, I just want to get in the water, and yeah. I, and um, like if you're catching stuff with a rod and reel, it's fun. But like at least with spearing, if even if there's no fish, you're swimming and you're doing stuff. Yeah, well, I'm I'm about fifty fifty on it. I do when I go out, I spend half my day fishing, half my day spearing. Okay. Because I like going right out the back in the deep and fishing for the the silvers and reds and stuff like that in the deep. But then I'll come back into the shallows and I'll just check out, try to get a trout or a cray usually on the way home. So it's usually split the day according to tides, really. Okay. So how how does it work with your tides? What what do you what do you do? So low tides usually, just just so I can get me cray. Just oh, some, yeah. when you're in the shallower water, you can if you lose another two or th- two two or three meters, you're right. Just <laughs> less two or three meters less, you got to dive. And you're having a, a chasing tropicals or painters? Yeah, painters and the tropicals. Yeah. Well, it's funny because up here, it's so um, the green cray are classed as the painted cray. It's it's the opposite. Everyone calls a painted cray the um, the green cray. Yeah, right. And so when we go out, we're like, look at this painted cray. And they're usually the bigger ones and they've got the more colours. Mm. And I think they're called, uh, do you know the name of them there? Nah, I'm looking it up right now. Yeah. And um, they're usually the bigger ones and you get the jumbo cray with, long, with the real long legs as well. Mm. And they um, are really, really sought after. But I actually go for the green cray, which is actually called the painted cray for some reason. Like the Innisfail people have really stuffed it up. So it's, yeah, right it's the opposite. I'm looking up painted cray. It's a pain in the ass here too. Like, cause there's ornate, uh, there's a, yeah. the Panu Lyris versicular. That's WA by the looks of it. Uh, so the ornate is the, what we call the painted. Okay. But, I think the green, yeah, we call them green crays, the other ones. Yeah. And they're usually a smaller cray, but they can get up to like the three kilo mark. Oh, yeah, right. Eh? Sweet. Oh, here's a truck. Yeah, yeah, we can get up to five to six kilo cray up up here. Yeah. So, so crays or, or lobsters for, for our US uh, listeners. How, how do you cook them? Because I, I personally think the the the, fir, the warmer the water, the, the, the not as – Nice tasting they are. What do you agree or? Yeah, I, I I haven't really eaten too many of the southern stuff. Oh, good, don't it'll ruin you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I've eaten so much of the other stuff. But, yeah, yeah, um, but you obviously love them because you're catching them yeah. all the time. Yeah, I, I usually do spaghetti with them. I just yeah. my family loves a good crayfish yeah. or spaghetti. I was wondering about like doing a peanut satay with one. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder how that'd work with one. Yeah, it would. You just got to, yeah, it's like everything, any crustacean, don't overcook it. Just get yeah. it to the right area and get it out as quick as you can. So how do you how do you manage that? Like what's your what's your, what's your go-to? So you just, do you parboil them or you do them on a barbie or? No, so I just actually, to peel a cray, it's so much easier when it's three quarters frozen still. Yep. Just chop through. I just get um, scissors and chop through the frame with the scissors and split it open. And then I just chop it into fine bits. Chuck it in the pan for like thirty seconds just to sear it a bit. Mm-hmm. Then, then chuck it in a pot, and I uh, give them a boil. I put what do I cook it with? I put uh, white white wine, mm-hmm. uh, chili flakes, parsley, chicken stock, and and sometimes uh, trident. I think it's trident sweet chili sauce. Mix all that through it, and then you're just- gonna have to you're gonna have to submit that recipe. I think. <laughs> the 99 spare recipes book, man. Yeah. And yeah. then, um, yeah, a bit of parsley in with the spaghetti and that's it. It's yeah. pretty quick yeah. and easy. 
because I'm no special. I'm no cook. I've actually, I'm mates with Harry that you had on the yeah, podcast yeah, there. Yeah. I don't even want to talk to him about cooking. <laughs> 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 when you're around proper people, way eh, that like um, whatever it is, like like Harry's definitely like a chef. Like if you're around a proper chef, don't matter how you cook, even if you think you're making your best stuff, you still feel like a caveman. Oh no, even less like me spearing around as it's just mm. like okay. Yeah, what what it's like you... they pity me when I go spearing with them. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, I hung out with the boys for a couple of days and spared with them um, on the uh, bunker group trip, and I don't think I'd been spearing for a couple of months. My diving was pretty pathetic, but, the, like, oh, those boys work such a good system. Yeah. Like, and I had an absolute ball with them, eh? Like, um, some of the most fun diving I think I've ever done is diving with yeah. those boys. They, they just have a good time, and they, they just work safe and, and, and really effective. I think the main thing with Az is just eye contact. He's always looking at you for eye contact and he's always, when he goes down, he's making sure you're looking at him. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. And I'm, I tell you what, being grown up in North Queensland without um, hanging around people like Az, there's so many bad habits and spearing up here. It's yeah. not funny. Yeah. It's very dangerous and it's it needs to change and a lot of people need to start doing the free dive courses and all that sort of stuff because it's, really really dangerous at the moment a lot a lot of your a lot of your diving i guess is pretty shallow and i, I mean some yeah. of the some some of the guys are pushing out and they're chasing some of the the species where you really only get on the drop-offs and stuff like the the reds and the nanny guys and stuff but um why, why do you think it's so dangerous is it because the diving's like relatively low barrier to entry there's really no formal learning that you need to do like, what, what's dangerous about diving up there I think because we live in one of the most awesome parts of the world where everything's, you can get a trout in two metres of water and then people are swimming out to five metres of water and they're chasing trout and then they, they might go to 10. Yeah. And when you're on that edge of 10, that's when stuff changes. You really have to have a, a buddy after 10 or around 10 onwards or oh, just someone in the area. Yeah. And I just find a lot of, up here, everyone gets a little bit greedy and they want to, go in their own direction and try to get the trout or the cray before the other person gets to that rock and all that sort of thing. So yeah. there's a lot of that happening. Do you and guys, are you diving in current much? Oh, not really. When you're on the top of the reef and if you're not on the edge of a channel, it's usually pretty pretty good in any, yeah. any type of tide. It's only when you're on the edge of the reefs or the um, channels, that's when you get a bit of current. And uh, visibility is usually not that good where you don't get current though. Yeah, right. Eh? So it's it's you can go from oh, five meters, but you get out on the edge of the channels and go up to twenty meters. Yeah, right. Eh? And and how far are you motoring out most days? Where where are you exactly? Um, in this far, just south of Cairns. So yeah, eighty kilometers south of Cairns, and it's it's funny. It's the closest point where the reef comes. Um, south of Cooktown, and so we're the second sort of closest place to the reef. Okay. Out of nearly everyone beside anyone north of Cooktown. So your motor out, your average motor out. What what are the? What, are you heading out of Innisfail itself, or are you? Launching? Yeah, we go to a place called Marine Harbour or Flonfish Point. Okay. And um, my boat does all right, so I usually get out there in about oh, twenty-two minutes on a flat day. Okay, but Jesus. um, that's good. That's doing forty-seven knots. <laughs> so <laughs> hold on to yourself. <laughs> but the average person is probably forty minutes to an hour to yeah, get to yeah. the closer reefs, and then then it's probably that again yeah. to get to the outer reef and where all the where the better like fish are and all the all the predatory stuff is. I noticed with um, like I've watched your YouTube channel a couple of times, and I noticed like I don't know if it's a lifestyle thing up where you are because you guys. Like you go out and you your day's mixed. Like you don't go out and just spear. You'll you'll have a surfboard in the back if you can. I know you mm. like chasing waves out there, which is can be quite a rare happenstance. But you like the line fishing, and even just a, you, you guys just seem to like a day out in the water. You don't seem to have that scarcity mindset down here in Brisbane. I find a lot of the time I get out, I just want to go spearing from dawn till dusk, and uh, and then head in and I'm buggered and I throw my esky in the garage and I'm done for the day. But up there, the lifestyle seems a bit different. Yeah, we we do get if you're set up right, you you can actually head out and get a lot of good days out on the reef. Yeah, and um, just that's what I, I told you before, and it was my um, 
from Friday till Sunday if the weather's good on the reef. That's that's a law I've got with my wife, and <laughs> and it's standing. <laughs> <laughs> You say that from oh, the comfort of the man yeah. shed and all the soundproofing you've got. <laughs> Just next door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, oh, mainly not Sundays. Just because I don't like coming home and have to clean on a Sunday afternoon and then boom, yeah. Yeah. it's work sort of thing. I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll only go on a Sunday if the weather window. That's the only day. Yeah. So do you, you work like a dog the rest of the time on the banana farm or is it like seasonally like hard and, and – Oh, it's all year round. The bananas, there's no pause button on them. They're just every week we cut bananas and pack them in boxes and head them, send them south, yeah. Is, that, is the climate fairly consistent for that? Is that partly why? Or? Um, winter, it does slow down. Yeah. Like at the moment, it's probably average 26 degrees during the day, so it's not hot or not cold. Yeah. But um, in the summer months, yeah, just one week, you get a storm or something and it's in a full moon, like, Going off tides and stuff, full moons actually make your fruit grow twice as quick as well. Holy so, moly. But we always find it's the week leading up to the full moon. Mm. Your fruit just takes off and you can actually two weeks can come into one one in summer and just cause you all types of hell. Being a farmer, like farmers in my experience are always a bit more in touch with the seasons, with, uh, with observing nature and how it um, – not just impacts their direct surroundings and their crops and stuff, but also how it affects everything. Have you noticed some parallel behaviour with fishing and the reef and stuff? Yeah, it's mainly just the moons and 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 the main one is I actually heard it on another podcast is the moon when it um, you get a new moon it usually your weather runs along with that so whatever that weather is mm. that's the weather you're going to get mm. from then on and. Um, we call it an old Italian saying up here. They 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 say it a lot, but I've checked it a few times and it doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> Those rules of thumb, like they always just go out the window. Like whenever you think you've you're onto something, sometimes they they break. Yeah, another good one is with the reefs up here and and current. Ash told me the other day, you know, and I finally figured it out. He goes, get a map of Australia, stand it up, and then just say. Um, when the tide's going out, that's the way it's like the Australia's dra- draining. So that's the way the current's going. When the tide's coming in, it's actually going the opposite way. He goes, so that's how you work off your currents. That's probably just the east coast with the east Australian yeah. um, current, yeah. though. Cause it, I don't know the people are suddenly yeah. <laughs> straight <there. laughs> And it's it's like you don't, you don't even pay attention to some of the meta. Uh, the, what do you what would you call it? Like the the meta behaviors of the you know the broader ocean and stuff, but the yep. ocean has its own weather. Like and even the way you know deep nutrients get brought up shallow and stuff like that, and all the oceans behave differently. Like um, WA sounds completely different than um, than over here, you know. So yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. If your buddy had a blackout on your next beer fishing trip, think what would the outcome of that be? Do you know how to revive someone from a blackout? Would you even be in a position to do something about it? Or would you be diving, chasing after a fish as your buddy sinks down to the bottom of the ocean? Do you know where most blackouts happen? Do you know what you can do to minimize your risk of having a blackout? My name is Ted Hardy, and I'm the founder of freedivingsafety.com. In my free online course, you will learn the truth about shallow water blackout, the myth of, I don't push myself, I know my limits, I'm in tune with my body how to minimize your risk of having a blackout, and most importantly, how to save your buddy's life if they have one. Visit freedivingsafety.com to sign up for your free course today. Dive safe out there. It's it's not even that hard. Back to boats. You're selling a boat at the moment. Um, What are you selling? I've got an eight-meter hooker, and it's my favorite boat and probably the best boat I've ever owned, but... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, hang on. You're not doing a full sale ad here. <laughs> and, mate, it's really good and you should buy it, everyone. <laughs> yeah. An eight-metre boat. It's a trailer boat. Yeah, it's a trailer boat, but it they say it's eight-metre. I don't know who's holding the fucking measuring tape at Hooker, but it's not eight metres. <laughs> I think it goes, wraps around the gunnel or something. <laughs> so it's about a what? It's about like 7.4. A, yeah, righto. It's yeah. still a big trailer boat, though. 
Yeah, it's it's a nice trail, but it's yeah, oh, it it'll be look good on one of your listeners, I reckon. No. <laughs> What it's you- actually real, really low sides, good dead rise. It's a really good uh, boat for North Queensland. Okay. It hasn't got it hasn't got a deep V, but it's got a racing style V, so yeah. it's very quick across the water. So but- you don't need a deep V because you're not uh, we, you're dealing with fetch, but you're not really dealing with um, swell, I guess. Or- yeah, we get short short chop up here, which would be shit. I'd imagine. Yeah, it, it's probably worse. Well, yeah. I don't know. When I go at the back and I hit the swell, it's like, oh, I'd rather be in short shit, really, because okay. it does swell does slow you down. Yeah, because, I guess the shapes of hull really come into, you know, your local conditions and stuff. So Yeah, so they're a very good North Queensland boat. And it's a it's an alloy boat? No, it's a fiberglass, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to pull I'm, one up. I'm going to go back to aluminium, I think, just because I'm a little bit – I like being on the reef and close to the reef and sometimes you can po- possibly rub the reef. Yeah, I've yeah. Been, well, that's I've been good in this one, but, yeah, I've I've owned a few boats. Over the, we actually had a 33-foot Riviera and they're like a game boat pretty much. Oh, they are a game boat. Flybridge. We used to, <laughs> we used to, yeah, we used to take it up on the reef exactly where I go spirit now mm. in one metre of water. Because <laughs> <laughs> it had two... Um, screws on it, two motors. You could just, they're so you can just steer them anywhere. They just like you turn them like a clock, left left forward or port forward and stab it down, and they'll just spin on a dime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got more control than a small boat. So you're running dual outboards on the on the hooker though? No, just one single. Yeah, two fifty or something. Uh four hundred, four hundred oh. uh, Mercury. Yeah. It's a big motor and it's it's a quite a lot of fuel, I'd imagine. Yeah, it's it is, but I've always been told fuel's the cheapest part of your boat. So <laughs> when yeah. you really think about it, yeah. And um, if you take a crew of two or three people, it's hundred and fifty liters or something. End of the day, on a if you're if it's flat, you can just go flat stick all the way out and all the way back. And what's that? Fifty bucks each. For an awesome day, fill, yeah. fill your eskies in your belly. So, hundred percent. That's bloody excellent. That's pretty good. Mm. You've, so, you've owned a range of boats. Um, did you start off in boats when you were young, and and how did you learn? Because I've never owned a boat. I'm nearly forty yeah. years old. I have always wanted a boat. Never been in a position to buy one. And I think once I'm in a position to buy one, and I buy one, I'll never be in a position to buy anything else ever again. <laughs> <laughs> there are. They're, uh, Bad habit to get into. Yeah. <laughs> I've only had this one three years and it's just like, oh, should I? Actually, because the uh, COVID price of boats has gone through the roof as well, so I can actually nearly go, get what I paid for it selling it now. So, and I just, the reason why I wanted to get a new one is so I can head out to Flinders Reef and just do some some uh, Coral Sea stuff in a bigger boat. But um, so getting back to your question, it was... I grew up having a, my old boy had a little catamaran and then we bought a big uh, aluminium catamaran, just a, a power boat, yeah. single motor. And then he bought a Cairns Custom Craft. It was actually a another aluminium cat. And we had that for a few years and I've had a, had it. That's pretty much where I cut me, cut me teeth mm. in that one. So I learned to spear out of that one. And Cause, yeah. Cause like, uh, you got VMR Coast Guard there in Innisfail, or where's your nearest one? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we do have it in Innisfail, but I'm very shitty. I never use it. I never do trip yeah. sheets. I, um, don't listen to me, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Please fill in your trip sheets. I've had a couple of toes back in, like from really far out offshore and other people's boats, and um, and it's a nerve wracking thing, you know, and like. One time, one time it was really serious, and you know it took I think eight or nine hours for them to get us back in, and it was dark. Um, and when what I got out of it wasn't this guy's fault, and uh, it was a mechanical failure. I won't name the outboard brown brand. <laughs> <laughs> they're all as bad as each other. Yeah, I think so. They they have batches, eh? We're like they're good for a couple of years, and then they shit again, like like some car manufacturers. But um, <laughs> but this one, I, I don't think it was a dud. It just packed up and that was the end of it and that, and then he changed outboards after that but like just like I've, I've been on other boats too when things have gone wrong and s- some people just know how to fix everything 
I'm not one of those people. Um, are you one of those people and how do you become one of those people? I'm to a point I'm one of those people, but it's it, sometimes you think um, the crew I take, sometimes you always have that one mechanical friend that just knows everything and I'm yeah. just like, he's coming with me. <laughs> <laughs> Good set of skills to have, eh? You might be a shit spiro, but you can fix it out more. The way you come, you're coming. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in saying that, these new motors, you can't really do too much to them. It's just as long as they're getting fuel and a bit of power, that's pretty much all you can do. Yeah. So there's not too much you can play with because there's just so so many bloody computers involved. Yeah. And so, I guess yeah, it's just making sure there's no water in the fuel or fuel's beautiful and, yeah, you've got a lot of, lot of charge in your batteries. Yeah, okay. Um, any horror stories for you? Oh, you, 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 <laughs> you, like, you said you've been out to Flinders before, um, yeah. which is 240K trip. Is that in a straight line? Yeah, in a straight line it is. I've actually checked it out on um, Navionics not long ago just to see how far it is again because I'm – Really keen to get back out there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so I went out on a friend's big Riviera. It was like a 60-foot, and he had a, we had three boats in tow and stuff like that. So it took us 16 hours at at eight knots or something to get there. So it was a bit of a trip to get there, and we actually lost <laughs> one funny story. I was laying, because we had the boats all tied up off the back, and we, we've never really towed boats before and don't know really – how to handle them and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. so I just, it was like just on daylight, all night I'm waking up because we put lights on top of the boats just to make sure they'll, we could count how many lights were behind us. Yeah, yeah. I woke up and I kept looking and I'm like, all right, it's there. And then I, I just had a feeling it like just on dawn, I woke up and I looked up and my boat was there. And then I just nodded and about, it felt like five minutes later. And I thought, oh, I just got to check again. I got up and all I seen was my boat was a little speck on the horizon. Another probably five minutes and we wouldn't have found it. Jeez. And it was the rope snapped, at the, uh, the bridle at the front of the boat snapped from the big uh, seas we were in. So, Shit. yeah, so we we're only 16 miles from Flinders when it happened. And, and a, a friend and I were about to jump into the boat well, we pulled right up beside it it's in about a, a kilometre of water yeah. and we, we jumped in the, he jumped in the water. We both jumped at the same time, but he went before me and I said, all right, you can drive it back. So he was in like 30 knot seas getting battered while I'm sitting on the 60 foot just drinking beer and watching him <laughs> copper <laughs> hiding for an hour. <laughs> he got he it like, though. That's the last time I jumped first. <laughs> uh, he was a good mate. That was probably the one fixing all your outboards too. Yeah, that was him. <laughs> Sounds like having, yeah. having good mates as part of boats as well. Yeah. It's a magical place, Flinders Reef. Like it's it it just etched a big, big place in my heart. It's like I really want to get back there. It's It was eight, nine years ago and every day you sort of, not every day, but you think about it a lot and the experience you had there. Yeah. So what, did you shoot? Dog tooth, did you see some special fish like? Back then, it's so funny because us being North Queenslanders, we don't chase pelagics, we chase edible fish. We call edible fish is coral trout and coral trout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else is not a coral trout. It's not a coral it. trout, mate. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you get the odd um, lazy red emperor or something swim past you, it's just coral trout and coral trout. So... Most spiros in North Queensland, that's all they come home with in their esky is a coral trout, maybe a uh, black spot tusky or something, but, yeah, yeah there's just pretty much only a, three things you a, see in their esky. <laughs> just to get a bit of colour in there apart from just <laughs> bloody, the red the red uh, coral trout. Yeah, we so actually every now had then a, you get a real good spiro come out with us. His name was Mick Creperi. Okay. He's a really good spiro and Crap he went up. out. Yeah, crappy, you know him? Oh, I know of him. I don't know him personally, but yeah. Yeah, and he, he went out and he um, was spearing by himself because these two dudes come up from down south and they had no idea. They told us they were real good spearers and stuff and nothing really happened. They just got seasick and stayed up the front of the boat. So Crapper was stuck by himself spearing. So he um, he got a, a couple of dog tooth and stuff like that and 
one afternoon it was like just on dark and it was in 60 meters this is at flinders reef the furthest reef out out to sea and we we were driving in from a fishing session we drove past him and he's swimming by himself and i could see him he's like looked like he's palming and we pulled up and said crapper what are you doing and he had a spanish mackerel on the side and he was chumming up with it trying to get doggies around yeah and the boat the big boat was about 500 meters away and we said to him you're right crapper and he's going yeah 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 so we drove back to the boat <laughs> and he said we thought he said he was going to swim back to the boat but he was actually palming off sharks <laughs> And, and he got back to the boat. He goes, you fucking real? <laughs> you know, kill me. The whole time he's just palming off sharks. Well, he's got this mackerel strapped to his side and he's chumming up trying to get. And I just thought, he's, that's the craziest human being I've ever met. Yeah. <laughs> Jeepers, what a character, eh? Did he, um, did he, yeah, did, so, did, did yeah. you ask and him if he caught anything? Coral trout out there. <laughs> 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 no, he, I think he got that, that big, um, the big Spanish, but he used it for bait. <laughs> they apparently pretty good burly though. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, another crazy story out there was we were fishing and I pulled, I pulled up a, a green job fish off the bottom mm. and it was in about 20 meters of water, but out there 20 meters looks like five meters. Yeah. The water's that clean. And I pulled it up halfway and then bang, something hit it. So I let it, it took it out of my hands and I finally got it up and the, there was a job fish that was just totally skinned. And I'm like, yeah. that's not a shark. So I just dropped it back in the water and dangled it near the side of the boat. And no shitting me, I reckon I still, to this day, I reckon it's one and a half to two meter coral trout. Wow. Come up. And the other fellow goes in the boat goes, no, that's a trout. And I put me head, so I put my goggles on, stuck it over and dang, dangled it again. It was a coral trout. I'm like, how big is that thing? It's, just a they just get so just a fat. Terror train. Mm. It'd have to be yeah, that sort. No of way we're catching sort. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Far out. Yeah. So spearing out there is just amazing. It's just the trout you see are so huge. You just can't spear them because they're against, like illegal. And once they get over, I think it was 80, 80 something centimeter, eighty two centimeters yeah. is a blue spot. Yeah. To get over that size, so there's. There's, and you're on top of the water and you think, I'll just go down and spear this little trout. But then you get halfway down and realise it's not five metres, it's 20. And so you, your bum's hanging out by the time you get there. Yeah. And then you, you shoot this fish that you think's a little fish and you bring it up and it's probably a prized fish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Best of times. Yeah. Well, coral trout will do that to you in, in um, clean water too. Like you, it's, just, it's hard to sometimes determine how big they are. I even find that on the on the bunker. Uh, and that's as far north as I've been or as far out on any of the reefs. So uh, yeah. I've done that trip four times now, I think, but I, I've loved it every time. But that um, the trip out I did on the charter was something different. Like working off a big mothership like that, there's something to be said for that too. It's quite, it's fi it's fishing the life of luxury, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> big yeah. big motherships are, yeah, it's just like, Cheating. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it, like it. We were out in the in the dories like in the day, and it, the, the wind would get up and that. But you're always looking forward to a warm shower, a warm meal, and a couple of beers on the back. Like, um, you know, like whereas if you're out there on overnight or in one of those like small glass boat, you just cop it. You know? Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> you really there's nowhere to hide nah, sometimes. Nah, so. <laughs> Especially being that far out to sea, uh, your weather can turn and lucky there's a, a K out there as well and uh the this is a awesome bird life on it you can actually walk up to the birds and pat them oh, they yeah. just because they don't know what humans are oh wow so is the has the has the k got a bit of a break in it so you can get the big boat in there or is it you yeah just... you can bring the boat right up to it pretty much yeah oh, it's wow. fully deep, deep all the way up to the k and, and yeah, this no. this time when you go back out, because it's nine years on in your spearing journey, um, what do you want to do this time? You, you, you're going to go you're a bit more ambitious with regards to pelagic fish? Yeah, I am. I actually don't mind the pelagic fish now, so it would be good to go and dangle out and become a human meat tray out there and then <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> sharks? But, sharks are a problem out there? Yeah, they are. There's... Because it's a nesting turtle site, certain times of year, we were there in November and the tiger sharks we've seen are just amazing. There's um, We went there like on the first day to that little island and 
on the way back, we had to pull back into the long because we had boat issues. On the third day, the first day there was no dead turtle on the island. The third day there was a dead turtle on the island and it had its ass bitten off. And it was a big, big turtle. Yeah. <laughs> and so, tiger yeah. sharks love them, eh? I've seen a couple of videos like getting around on the socials like of tiger sharks eating turtles. That'd be an awful way to die, wouldn't it? Especially uh, with the shell on that. I just felt so bad for it because it looked like it just crawled. It made it to the beach. It thought it was fine, but, yeah, it just slowly died on the beach. With its ass hit. Yeah, it was a huge green turtle, yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, and we've seen that up the first afternoon. We've seen a couple of big ones, mm. big um, big tigers coming under the boat in the shallows. What's your experience being in the water with tigers? Because, like, I've been in the water with them and they've seemed to – well, every time I've been in the water with them, they've kind of been pretty calm. But I've seen them from the boat in a completely different sort of uh, behaviour. Yeah, usually tigers, they just come in and have a look and piss off. They don't don't really have too much. And, like, it's the, the height in the water or all that sort of thing, the shark behaviour. If they think you're up there, you're just as dominant. So as long as you keep your eye on them. And every time I see one, I still am pedaling for the boat and keep my eye on it. I don't like being in the water with them. It's not like I'm, I'm comfortable, but yeah, I just find they, they've never actually caused me any issues. Mm. So there's other smaller bloody white tips and black tips have caused a lot more issues than those things. S- smaller ones as well. Yeah. I think anything up to like a meter and a half, they, sometimes they just get in a <laughs> stupid mood yep. and they'll, they'll just come at your flippers, biting them and, yeah, you just got to make sure you're flipping back and keep an eye on them and give them a nudge with your end of your spear. Do you think it's just like um, obviously the bigger ones get smarter and they the otherwise they don't survive? Because well, I, I was reading the shark thing and they were saying like as sharks get, the bigger ones are, are more and more wary because any form of injury to an animal that needs to swim all day long means death or, because it, either it can't catch food or... Or it's going to become a target of other um, creatures because even if they just drop a fraction of speed, you know that's going to stop them from getting a meal and stuff like that. So it's like the bigger they get, the more paranoid they get of becoming injured and stuff. So the smaller ones seem to be the dumbest ones. Mm. And I think most of the young blokes that have passed away from sharks up here have just been in that wrong place at the wrong time, and um, some of them are keeping the the uh, trout and stuff on their person and stuff like that. So being a bit wise in those areas and that's where a dive buddy really helps too is having in the water with sharks because you you can group up and sort of head off together and then the shark sort of doesn't know what you are because you're, you've once turned into two sort of thing. So if you can get back to the boat before anything bad happens, it's, it's usually fine. And you reckon uh, are you the dusk? Dusk shark behaviour, do you think it changes things? Have you been in the water on uh, on the end of the day's light? Not really. I don't really like being at the reef in the water in the afternoons or early. Well, I'd probably do early morning because I've done a lot of surfing in the early morning. Yeah, and stuff yeah. Like Into the reef, but, yeah, not really. Um, yeah, I just don't. I definitely think dusk and dawn is the time when they're more predacious. Shrek, Jeremy here, man. I'm back. Just wanted to say the podcast is growing from strength to strength, my friend. Hoorah, man. I just wanted to say thank you for your uh, continual support from the Noob Sparrow listeners, subscribing, reading, writing, and submitting kick-ass spearfishing adventures from all over the planet. Your listeners kick ass, and Shrek, my friend, so do you. All you guys, come check out the next edition of Spearing Magazine at spearingmagazine.com. Jeremy out. Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuna guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say crikey mate, or say Shrek from the Noob Spear I sent you. And you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check them out. You, you mentioned uh, white tip and black tip reef sharks. What experiences have you had? Have you have you been bald before? 
Not well, I've seen a couple of Sharknados yeah. when just spearing um, Spannies and that, but small well, Spanish mackerels. Yep. But um, other than that, yeah, they they're pretty good. I find flashes really excite them too. The noise of the flashes and that they can just turn very quickly into from just a calm shark that. It's not really just, I call them dogs. They just look like, a, they act like a dog. They hang around you like they want food, but they just always sneak in past you when you're spearing. They don't really cause any. But as soon as you start making a bit of a commotion, they're the first thing to come to them to your spear. Yeah. It's a weird thing too because commotion and noise and, and the light from the flashes, it's like you, you want to attract, you know, your target species. But, yeah, it sometimes it seems like you just get sharks. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm not really a, I've never really used um, the boys and all and ropes and all that. I've always just had real guns and stuff. So I was, I'm still, as a spear, I've got a lot to learn about all that sort of stuff. So have you, have you been spooled? No, I, I usually just bloody, if I can get back to the boat as quick as I can and just hold on to the spool and just let it burn through my hands until, yeah. <laughs> until something happens, either rips off or not. But yeah, it's not, a, it's not the right way, but. That's all I've got at the moment, and that's because the mate. When I go out, I don't really um, like how you say you go out and you just have one day. You just focus on doing this. I go out and I've got three things I'm focusing on. I yeah. go out for a surf, a spear, and a fish. So most of the time, if you watch me, I'm just wearing a bloody fish skin shirt or something, yeah, and yeah. bodies in the water. I don't. Yeah, I just jump in, and I just find getting dressed in that gear. I could have had a fish in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> if the water's tropical. It's not like you really, as long as you've got gloves, which I don't wear half the time, but as long as you've got gloves and knife, goggles and, and your spear gun and a, and a weight, you're right. So what about stingers and stuff up there? Is that, you got nasties up there a lot? Yeah, we do get nasties inshore, but once you're oh, probably, I'd say probably five mile off the shore, you're the bad, because they're, the bad jellies are really coastal. Yeah. So most of your box jellyfish and your Irukandji jellyfish, they um, are born in mangroves and they're only usually really bad coastally on a northerly breeze and on yep. like flat days because I actually go surfing on rough days down at my local beach and in the middle of summer and I've never been hit with a jelly or anything like that because they, they tend to go deep when it's rough. Yeah, right. What what are you surfing down there? Or is it just fetch? Yeah, yeah. It's just 25 to 30 knots for a couple of days. You'll get a, a two to three foot wave sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, people surf freshwater lakes and stuff in different parts of the world when you get sort of hectic waves. If there's enough, if there's enough, um, like, um, like land, like, um, water surface, I guess there's enough, you know, time for the wind to do something to it to um, yeah. get you a decent swell. And what made you love sw surfing so much? You, you, you've grown up up there, haven't you? Yeah, I've grown up here. I was actually born on the Gold Coast and um, all my, most of my family came from there. So every Christmas we'd go down and, and stay on the Gold Coast for a couple of weeks. And so I sort of learned to surf around the Gold Coast, yeah. around Rainbow Bay and Snapper Rocks and stuff like that over the years. So it's just something I really love and I, I don't think I'll ever stop doing. Do you like the shories or the point breaks? Um, I'm actually a shorey man yeah, because right. on the Gold Coast, everything's a right and I'm a khaki foot, I'm bloody yeah, yeah. goofy foot. So that's why I'm so glad out this reef I've found out here, this spot I've got is all left. I call it left city. It's just constant lefts and it's huge. Yeah. Can get can get huge too. Or you just get good on your backhand. But um yeah. <laughs> like, who's, who's good at their backhand? <laughs> yeah, no one. Um I just always um I used to do a bit of boogie boarding, and when I came first came to Australia, uh, two thousand and four, um, I was here with a mate, and he was a hectic boogie boarder. Like he just loved the stuff, and the bigger, nastier shore breaks he could find, he was always there. And I remember going head over heels at Duran Bar there, landing on my head and more or less half knocking myself out and stumbling to shore. And it wasn't even big surf. It was quite pathetic. And these old people were just like, are you okay? And I was like, I think I'm done with boogie boarding. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my foray into into the surf world. But my younger brother loves it. Um, but, um, yeah, cool. I find it a weird uh, – well, it's not a weird crossover. If you love the water and you love, you know, the ocean, like 
um, you know, I've got another mate who likes kite surfing. So when it's super windy, he's loving it. I'm like, I can't go spearing. I've got nothing to do. You know, I'm not, I've never got nothing to do. But I mean, you know, I can't. I'm not doing what I want in the water. So, but he 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 loves it and frosts on it. So yeah, it's cool. It's di- like I said, it's different. Definitely a different lifestyle up there. Um, yeah. Well, there's not many like. There's not many people surf the reef up here. Mm. There's in my town. There's probably about well the people who I take and that's probably about four or five people. <laughs> so, so that's it. And and either, years ago there used to be a few dudes surf locally, but they all moved to the Gold Coast where, where they got gnarly. Yep. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> but, um, there is a group in Cairns, I think, um, that do a bit of reef surf and actually haven't caught up all because I'm not on Facebook. So every bloody group is on Facebook and yeah. I'm, I'm just – I'm just not a fan of Facebook, so I don't really go near it. Yeah. But um, there's I've, there's a few few good groups up there I've heard, and there's a couple of good breaks out off Cairns as well. Yeah, right. Um, another thing we we were chatting about was uh, was good boating behaviour. So you sent me a couple of notes here about good deck hands and good fish shows. Um, what what's uh, so you, you said um, having good deckies is a is a super important part of any trip. Um, so with your mates and the guys you take out with you regularly, what are some things that set them apart from from um, from others? Well, the thing is you're there to pull your weight and it's not a charter. Like <laughs> that's the word. And one that's really been pissing me off lately, and I don't know if any of my mates will be listening, I'll tell them to listen. <laughs> but Passive you aggressive. go out there and then they're like, so where's your hooks? I'm like, where's your fucking hooks? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll always bring them in that, but it's, I just feel like, mate, I've I've driven you here in my boat. I've got the bait. I've filled it up, and you ask me for a hook now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and it's yeah. I, I think the main thing is as long as you can pull your weight, and with me, as long as you can pull your weight, sort of be at like be at the anchor before I ask you to pull it up, or. You just you just sort of know over the times people are, who are really good seamen, yeah. and um, yeah, if you just can be at that point and cleaning the boat before you see the skipper clean it or something like that, just always keep the boat clean. Keep your just keep ahead of yourself. Pretty much, that's what a good deck is. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, with gear like you're going surfing, line fishing, spear fishing, all on the same day. I, I, I'd imagine like with if you got four people on there. And people bring too much shit, like that could also be a problem too. Do you get that as well? Like, yeah, we do get a bit of that. So I usually just say, no, I'll take my rods. And so I'll put my rods in the boat and just say, leave yours at home. Because that's probably my pet hate when there's too many rods in the boat. Yeah. There's this same, like, most of the time you don't, you only use 10% of them. <laughs> and there's yeah, rods yeah. out everywhere and you don't need them. Yeah. So rods and spear guns is another one. If you, I, I, I put everything in my dive bag in my spear gun bag now. So my flippers actually fit in the spear gun bag. So it's only one bag. Mm. Instead, I used to have two and it sort of got a bit clatterish. Yeah. So I try to fit everything inside the spear bag. I've got a nice big Rob Allen, Allen spear bag. So Yeah, yeah that, they're pretty handy and they're a decent size too. You should be able to get everything in there. Yeah. Mm. I reckon they just need to make them another probably 100 wider and then you can – fit everything definitely it's really hard to do the zip up yeah yeah oh, i never do the zip up they're always buggered within bloody 12 months <laughs> yeah, of buying do, it anyway. don't, don't matter how good a quality <laughs> bag is the zips never survive plastic um, no. whatever that uh, composite metal shit is they use it's all it's like a plastic metal <laughs> yeah yeah it's not like a it's not like um anything useful um <laughs> Yeah, even if you clean it up, clean the zips up, they they always seem to just turn to shit. But yeah, um, Velcro doesn't seem much better though either. So I don't know what the solutions are there. No, and I've I, I've I noticed as he brings like a uh, bucket, uh, not yeah. a bucket, like a crate with all his gear yeah, in it. I'm the same. That's yeah, a Brisbane so. thing, I think. <laughs> it's it's good and bad. Sometimes the crate can get in the way just as much as everything else. Yeah, yeah. So. As long as you got, I've got a big kill pen under the floor, so I just fill everything up in there and and um, put all the dive gear and all the gear under the floor and keep it all the way out of the way as much as you can. And then I just got up the front. There's an area where there's seats and stuff, so I just 
throw everything up there. It's not good to have your weight at the front just for speed because you want to go as fast as you can to the reef, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, like, I learned with stricken airs, like, is they, you know, they they like to go to the hot spots, like, on the reef. So they, they're looking for big aggregations of bait and stuff, and then they, they like to have a good look, good explore around there, and they, and they don't waste a lot of time in the ground in between sometimes. Um, is that something that you also do up there? Yeah, 100%. I, I tell people it's not a snorkel trip, it's a spearing trip. I can take you to all the good rocks you want. I don't need you to look at every other rock in between these rocks. <laughs> it's so annoying when you just see someone's just diving there and then they're just like, oh, go and have a look at this rock. They're like, no, get back in the boat, please. Because yeah. time is, is, is pretty important out there. It's like... you. You, you, you want your day, you want the most out of your day. So I try to tell everyone, like, we're going to get the most out of the day. Just listen to me and I'll just put you on the right rocks sort of thing. I, yep. I don't need you to look at those other rocks, especially when you've been out there a bit, you know the know the ground. Yeah, yeah. I've had the same issue, like um, particularly with current and pushing up and you know where the front edge is and you tell a person, all right, you're going to have the drop on the front edge of this reef. Like you're giving them the premium drop of the drift before you get back on the boat and get taken back up and maybe repeat it or change your drift line. And you know where the front edge is. So you jump in and you're like, okay, you're watching your marks and stuff and or your landmarks and then you're like, okay, um, you've got 10 seconds, take your final breath and go. And then 30 seconds later they're like, can I go now? And it's like, no, nah, you missed it. Get back <laughs> on the boat. We're going back to do it again. I'm taking the next dive. You're not getting one. <laughs> you know, but but some people, like some people, are just they they seem more freediver than Spiro. Like, yeah. um, I love having a look around and chilling out too. But when you're diving, particularly current and and specific structure, or you've got a time and a and a plan and stuff, you kind of got to work the plan. Like you don't have mm. time to piss around and stuff. No, and that's that's definitely like being out there where where I spear and that. There's so many rocks you can spear that are good, and there's so way many more rocks that you can spear that are crap. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Being able to spot a good rock from the surface is is nearly an art. Yeah. Self sometimes, and um, especially uh, been diving with as a lot lately, and just being going on the um, the pressure point side of the reef. Yep. So where the where the tides currents hitting the top of the reef and the pressure point side of the rock, mm-hmm. also that's where usually your bait hauls up is on the front side of the rock where the currents hitting it. So yeah. one thing I noticed up on that bunker trip, and I had a couple of opportunities, but I buggered them all up, was some decent jacks, and they yeah. like that brain coral where you've got this narrow gap between the sand or the rubble, and then um, and then they love to hang under and that sort of shit. How do you approach those fish and those, that, those opportunities? Like, because um, I, I couldn't seem to get it right. Because you can get right up in the hole again, but it seems like your sweet spot is before they get too deep into the cover. What, what's your take on it? You with jacks, you got to see them before they see you, mm. and then you might have you have a way more opportunity. But also, when you're diving those brain corals and that, a lot of people dive with their gun facing away from them and, and towards their flippers sort of thing, the, the tip, and they're just looking in under the holes. Yeah. Where actually, if you bring it to your side and have your gun ready, so as soon as you put your head in the hole, you have your gun sort of pointed in the direction of where you're looking. So if you see something, your gun's there. You're not yeah. drawing it around. By, by the time you draw it around, it's the, the fish are gone most of the time. And there's a lot of that happening with um, Jax's. they they're an easy hard fish to spear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've I've got a few good ones, but I, I can't say I've got any sort of regularity to my success with them. So I think it's more of a technique issue. So I yeah. think if you can, um, they they tend to cruise the rock. They don't just sit in one spot. They like to cruise around. So if you can actually guess where they're going to be and sort of meet them like be on behind a rock and try to get there before them and before and as they stick their head around and give them a plug sort of thing. Yeah. If you go chasing them, they're just going to take off. Do they cut the same laps or similar laps? No, they're they just cut. They go in the same holes. Like they're yeah. they're a funny thing. They usually don't leave the rock. Yeah. They're on. They'll just go deeper into the rock. 
They seem like the they seem like a lazy fish. Like they like they like some smaller bait around. Like I, I don't know if they need bait actually, but they're like dopey bait, like the little micro bait that's had that hang yeah. around the the caves and stuff. And then they 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 don't seem to be in current ever. No, and and the other thing is they're really what are they? They go inside the rock and they once they're in there, they'll they'll hold up in there and they'll just go really deep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're really hard to get out once you once you've scared them. Yeah. So it's, I don't think I've shot one over four kilo. So what's your best? I've never. I don't weigh fish and I don't measure fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I, sometimes I can, I, tell you, I can tell you one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could fit a, a full rum can in its mouth. Oh, like that's it, a big jack. Yeah, so I'm guessing ten probably, kilo. Yeah, ten kilo. Yeah, and we that's call reef reds there. So, Fire yeah, right. yeah, that's I, I've got a photo somewhere. Is that an Innisfail standard measure of a fish? <laughs> rum, yeah, I do it with me crabs as well. <laughs> <laughs> How many rum cans did you get in his mouth, mate? <laughs> mate, my jack was so big, I got a rum can in its mouth and one in its bum as well. <laughs> um, spearing deep. So it sounds like Az has been teaching you some technique, and uh, you've possibly been starting to hunt deeper. Like, what's that sort of journey look like? Yeah, well, well, since I've been doing the the, the dive course with him and stuff like that, and I fully recommend anyone out there, like I'm, like I said earlier, I'm no professional spear diver. I'm just an average Joe. So learning that has just, my progression's just taken off just from, oh, there's so much to learn in those courses and um, just being able to breathe up, learning to breathe up, knowing, knowing your contractions, your contractions are your friend, all that sort of stuff. Like before that, it was just, I just dive, went down and then until I got my first contraction and then just powered back up, I powered down, powered back up. And now I can just take a slower approach and relax down there. And the world's just a whole better place down there now. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's certainly some stuff to learn. I think only in a, in a good free diving course with, um, I think when you start having contractions during dives, like you're, the whole way you approach it needs to change in terms of I don't think you should ever dive like that unless you are sticking to buddy protocols and stuff because mm. um, it's a different way of doing it. But, um, yeah, I, I, get, I get what you're saying. Did it change anything else you do? Like um, uh, do, are you more methodical with the way you sort of um, plan your drop and stuff? Or? Yeah, so probably the best thing I've bought is a dive watch mm. and it gives you surface time Yep, because – being a trout spiro and a uh, crayfish spiro, you're just up and down all day. Don't don't even look at you. You're just down for a minute, up for a minute, down for a minute, up for a minute, just looking sort of thing. Yeah. But um, knowing that two down, uh, one down, two up, the old one minute down, two minutes up, or whatever it is you're down for, just yeah. double it. But um, once you learn that, you your day goes a whole lot easier. You're not as buggered at the end of the day as well because you're actually training yourself to. Just yeah, just uh, econ- be economical, pretty much. So yeah, one thing when you sit on the surface, say you do like a three minute service interval, and you actually count it, it forces you to be much more deliberate when you go to dive, rather yeah. than and and less kind of like, well, I've got I've got one opportunity at this like whatever this drop or whatever. Um, it's not like I can do it all over again. So you, it forces you to be a bit more I don't know deliberate and uh, less because yeah. you you can. You can work hard or you can work smart too sometimes with diving, eh? Like the guy that yeah. dives the most isn't necessarily the one that's going to get the best fish and that, or have the best time. Mm. I find a lot – I try to dive around with my deeper stuff. I just try to dive so I can just see make out a shape on the bottom. So just that just depends on, on – um, that's my favourite diving is just because – it can be 20 meters. It can be 10 meters. It just goes on the water clarity on the day. Yeah. Um, if you can make out a shape of a fish, you're, you've already halfway done the job. Like you've already, already seen the fish. Yeah. You know yeah. how to attack it, but sometimes you're diving down. And, and I noticed um, when, as taught me, when I, when you go down, put your chin to your chest Yep. And yep. and cause a lot of spiros, they just want to look where they're going and that's, that's consuming um, oxygen. Yep. So if you can put your chin to the chest and just relax, I find that 
it just the time goes all that. It's so quick yeah, that yeah, you yeah. sort of get into a meditative state and you're at the bottom. Instead of worrying about kicking and getting down there and having a look, you, you're at the bottom. Then you're like, your bottom time is like, I reckon, doubled just because you're that relaxed. You can stay, just sit on the bottom and just let everything come to you mm-hmm. because you're not going to be any faster than any fish in the ocean. Yeah. yeah. You might as well let them come to you. Mm. And 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 I, when you get there, when you're more relaxed too, like the fish are a bit more relaxed around you as well. You've got better body yeah. language and um, and more time to hang out and try and coax something in. So like yeah, that. for sure, it's yeah, it's an awesome world down there. I love it. Mm, me too. Um, well, it's been a, it's, it's probably been a month since I've been in the water, so I'm actually hanging out. Um, I'm hoping to get out maybe this end of this week if I'm lucky. Nice. It's been six days for me. <laughs> oh, envy you up there, eh? Gee, for Brisbane can be difficult sometimes. Um, uh, weather apps, weather apps up there. Like every every area of the world, um, obviously they rely on, you know, different uh, weather forecasting services. A lot of them, like in Australia, they all seem to use BOM data, which is Bureau of Meteorology data, but they interpret it in different ways. And some apps are good for some areas and some are not good for others, but... Um, I like this little rule you've come up with. Yeah, triangulate your <laughs> triangulate your apps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it just depends how much you want to go. If you if you wary of the weather, you go through all your apps and then just you can usually three or four apps. I use Sea Breeze, Woolly Weather, Boy Weather, and um go on those ones. You actually can get a good picture of what's actually gonna happen. You can get if two, you can believe two out of the three and stuff like that. But um, if it's if it's a if if you're really keen to get out there, you just look for the app that's gonna give you the best <laughs> forecast <laughs> and believe it. <laughs> show that one. Show that one to your wife. Yeah, this is the one I'm going out on. Yeah. yeah. That you really know what the weather's are like when you get to the boat ramp. If yeah. there's heat trailers there, it's a good day. If there's no trailers there, you start you start freaking out. You get a bit of a, a feeling inside. You're like, oh. These people know something I don't know, or, or I don't know. So you start looking at your apps again, and you're like, "No, it's, it's <laughs> Yeah, you get to the boat ramp, and you've told everyone because you like I've done it, and I'm the one planning the trip. And you get there, and there's like three trailers there, and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> "Yeah, yeah, they're bad, they're bad days. Those ones. Especially. Some of those days can be, um, but you can also. Jag a good day and you just you rub it in everyone's nose. Yeah, how good. Make sure you take lots of boat footage and flat water footage that day and put it in your Insta story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, being a farmer and a, and a man of the land as well, do you do you pay attention to things like chlorophyll and water temp and and other factors? No, not really. Water water temp's not a big deal up here. Like. Um, I just don't really have water. This I just find water temp. The only time I worry about water temp is in the cyclone season. Around cyclone season, when it gets around twenty-seven degrees out to sea, you know there's a cyclone going to burn up any second. So that's the only time I really look at water temp. Or if I'm chasing barra up the rivers, yeah, that's the only other time. Warmer the better with barra. Yeah, right. Eh? Mm. Oh, so you had much luck with barra fishing. Yeah, I usually go north when I do that up the Cape. Yeah. Have you and been spearing for bear or? No, I just had a friend that went the other day and he put a post up on Insta and I'm like, you bastard. Oh, that's one thing I want to do a bit more of. But up here, once you chase barra, once you spear a barra, there's something else that's in the water that can eat you yeah. and it's not a shark. Yeah. Do crocs- <laughs> usually where there's barra, there's crocodiles. Yeah, yeah. Do, do crocs freak you out more than sharks? Yeah, definitely. Way more. A shark, you got a chance. Croc, you got no chance if it's territorial. This time of year is not too bad because it's cooler weather and I think they go a bit – you could probably nearly get away with swimming with one if on a cool day. Yeah. And I watched a documentary in Africa or, or where this fall actually swims with them, but the water temperature has got to be a certain temperature. Yeah. Once that water temperature rises one degree, he's got to get out. And it's, <laughs> yeah, I was chatting with um, I was chatting with an old mate last time As was here in uh, Brisbane. Actually, his buddy, um, Wind and Willow and 
wind. What's the? Ta- I've got a company. Anyway, the bloke's got footage out out at sea with a big um, salty. Is that the one where you put on your thing the other day where a fella kicked it in the face? Nah, nah, that was some American stuff. Uh, that, nah, I, that was American. That, that actually looked like a crocodile. It might have been. They get crocodiles there though. In they Florida. do. Yeah, yeah. Yep. They're not um, the same, but yeah, they yeah they do. Um, alligators yep. are more common, and they're a completely different thing. But yeah, um, was it will and wind? Hang on. The buddies of as uh, stricken as. Hang on a sec. Let me just find it. Yeah, will and wind. Um, the bloke, f- um, one of the founders of will and wind. Um, he's got this awesome footage on. I'll go, I'll, I'm going to pull it up on another day. But um, yep. he's got really good footage of a of a croc out at sea, and it, and um, they they chased it. <laughs> <laughs> they were that keen on bloody seeing it, but uh, gee, for some unreal footage in crystal clear water. So they jumped in with it, or just, yeah, yeah, just, like, no, they were in the water with it, chasing yeah. it. <laughs> bloody well, reckon, certain times of year you can do that. I wouldn't want to do it from like November to March. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably Bre- stay away from, or probably October to March when the spring starts. You don't Bre- want to be in the water with a croc. Breeding season, or yeah. Yeah. They're just way more territorial as well. It's when they're, all this, they're going for the mate, looking for their mates and stuff. And there's so many more crocs in our area at the moment than there was 20 years ago. Yeah, it's right. probably quadruple. Something needs to be done. We better, <laughs> we better not get political. You're already a farmer and, <laughs> and I already say enough controversial shit, so I'll, I'll keep my opinions to myself. Um, other scary shit in the water, though, you up there, you got cone shells. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tell me about them. Yeah, we got uh, the deadly, probably the most deadly animal in the world. I think the cone shell are the, the venom they have inside them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I speared a cray one day, and I um, it was stuck in a hole. So I was had my hand in the hole for like five minutes trying to get it out because it wedged itself that far in. And I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and then I finally, because it's only like a meter or so, I get my head out of the water and breathe and keep pulling and. Finally got it out. When I pulled it out, two cone shells rolled out right beside it and their proboscis, whatever, that is sticking out and everything. And I'm just like, oh, shit. Because when you're holding on to a cray, you don't know what. There's so many spiky things. You don't know if you've been hit or not. And I heard with cone shells, they actually inject you with an um, anesthetic that numbs you so you don't feel the hit as well. And I was like, "Oh, so you were paranoid? You're wondering if you'd already been hit because you're." Yeah, I didn't know if it was hit or not. Oh, and I, was, I swam back to the boat and I said to my friends, "I'm like, if I start um, seizing up, you have to resuscitate me as for as long as the ambulance gets here." And because <laughs> what they do, I think they it's just a neurotoxin that just paralyzes you, yeah, paralyzes yeah, your yeah. body, but you actually awake still. Oh so wow! If someone's breathing and and doing all the chest compressions, you actually can survive it. I've heard. I don't know how how full on. So I was just telling them, giving the rundown. You know, you got to give me chest compressions and all this until we get back to the hospital. And I'm like, shit. And then I'm just sitting there waiting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So knowing that death's on its door sometimes is pretty scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But you know, but, shit, yeah, you nothing know, happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you're and you're here to make Taz yarns, which is a yeah. a fantastic new podcast. Um, how many have you already pre-recorded some episodes? When's this thing launching? I actually did one the other day, and I actually launched it the other day. And I, uh, I used a music producer that did my al- um, albums when I was in the band and stuff. So I had a good yarn with him. He actually, I had the first yarn with Daniel because he um help, actually helped me set up all the Zoom recording and all that oh, sort nice, of stuff. Oh, nice, nice. As you can hear, the quality is probably a bit better than a, a, a bloody um, pair of Apple headphones or something. So, Mate, Yarns with Az and Taz, the sound quality was fantastic. So. Yeah, and it's just going from that to Zoom, though, trying to get it through your interface and like, yeah, there's a lot, yeah, yeah. lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes when you do a podcast sometimes. Yeah. And, yeah, it's it takes a while to get used to it all, and I actually stuffed up the first podcast a little bit by having a backing track too loud at the end, and couldn't even hear what I was saying. Music- <laughs> and I put it up because I was just so munted, I just didn't want to redo it, and yeah, put it up and learnt my first mistake. <laughs> Music's crazy shit too with uh, with podcasting. Like, you, so much, you're not allowed to use just about anything. Yeah, um, but obviously, if it's your own music, I mean, of course you can do that. 
Yeah, that's what I try to do as much as I can use my own. You got a funny story with um my YouTube. I of course the songs I made are uh, have a copyright against them. I can't even use them. That I can't even release it for me to use it. Oh well, <laughs> that's YouTube. Sucks. And like you try to Google and find out how to release your own copyright in your own stuff, and it's it's a big deal. I'm like, oh, just don't worry about it. Far out. Yeah, I, I um I put up a video from my last South Australia trip, and I used a couple of tracks in there that said they are royalty free and um all the rest of it. Nah, got pinged, and the video is just um no royalties or whatever, but. I can't be bothered uh, editing it anymore. It was 35 <laughs> minutes long. It took me three frigging days to edit it. But, yeah. um, sometimes yeah. sometimes it's, if, even if it's, there's royalties in it, I, I, have, I haven't been had enough views or anything like that to really warrant worrying about royalties. So Yeah, I haven't either. And yeah, not, so sometimes it's just better to just at the start just plug it and get the good sounds and get them out there and then when people start liking it, then start doing your yeah. own music. That's not a bad idea. Um, it doesn't sound like you're much of a, a gear fanatic, but what is in your dive bag up there? Uh, I've got two Rob Allen gun, rail guns. I've, oh, well, one's a, uh, I turned it into a bloody roller. Roller. So, do you like it? Yeah, it's really accurate. Mm. Oh, the, the, the funny thing was years ago, we used to only use air guns. And so the air guns, as you know, aren't as accurate because you can't see down the barrel and Pneumatics. stuff like that. But yeah. of course, yeah. crayfish, you can stick them in a hole and, and rustle them around and they're pretty good for crayfish. That's why I still use a small one sometimes on the craze. See, but, uh, how does that, how does it, how does the pneumatic work again? How do you pump, pump it up? Oh, you so say you just pump, you, it's just like a compressed air cylinder. So you just mm. pump it up, put 500 pumps in it, and then it lasts forever, or not forever, but until the seal goes. So, Oh, okay. um, so it's just you just it's just like you're pushing against the hard compression to lock it in. Yeah, yeah. Once it's locked in, it'll fire. But um, I've actually had a fairly. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go through the um the gear first. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so I've got the Rob Allen. I've got the Diver flippers. I yeah, I know. Um, Penetrator is another good set of flippers. But um, I've got the dive R's at the moment. What design did you get from the dive R? He's got some mad designs. Yeah, I got the one with the squid and the marlin, and the, there's everything on it. It's, it's all, the other, actually, all the shit you don't spare up there. Yeah, you should just have a coral trout on it, man. Yeah, <laughs> I actually contacted him because I wanted to put that design on my boat when I first built it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But the design on my flippers had a lot has a lot more purple and stuff. But when I actually got the full picture of it there was a lot of orange in it and it wasn't as good as the design i have on my boat now so i went with the other design right. but yeah i had to, i contacted the artist and i was going to pay the artist and everything a royalty to put it on my boat and stuff so yeah. the so i got flippers goggles just got cressy goggles with a um gopro mount on the top you like that yeah. oh it gets in the way sometimes but when does it get in the way well when you put your head in the hole for craze and stuff yeah. like that does it flood you your can... mask? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the number one complaint I've heard about them. Like, yeah, just the fact that having it integrated like that when you're going into structure or around weed or whatever, you know, like if you bump your head, it floods your mask, and then it's like, I've got to bow and go up to the surface, and that's the, that's the only reason why I stuck with the strap over the integrated one. But yeah, there's a couple of little tricks I do when I dive as well. I might as well bring them up while I can. Is um. When I'm because you don't really take too much notice of what's around you when you're looking in a hole, so I'll, I'll look in, but with my other hand, I'll bring it over the top of my head and guard the top of my head. So when I'm coming up, I can feel if there's a rock above me or not. Oh, so yeah, that'd be right if you got gloves on, yeah, especially with a <laughs> fire coral or something nasty. <laughs> yeah, we don't have too many nasty corals up here, really. Oh, yeah. Um, so we, we just, I just always just have my head guarded when I, especially in an area where I've sort of, you've dived around the whole rock and you haven't really had a good look. So you're looking in under the rock the whole time. And another one I do is always put the, um, gun by my side if I, if it feels sharky. Yeah. So 
you sort of got that protection, a little bit more protection if a shark comes out of nowhere and try to give you a hit while you're looking in under the rock. At least it's going to hit your gun first. Yep. That's I don't know if that's a mental thing or that's just something I do when I yeah, yeah. feel a bit uneasy. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've got to have ways of dealing with, with the – Generally, you've got anxiety for a reason. Even the, the 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 number one problem I think with anxiety in normal everyday life is that you can't find the bloody um, the reason for it. Yeah, and that's what half the people making money and self help stuff that that's trying to help you find the, the 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 cause of your anxiety. When you're in the ocean and you're spearfishing and you've got anxiety, it's for a reason, and uh, <laughs> and you you have to listen to it and develop these um these systems and techniques that. A, maybe help mitigate risk, like best case, but B, at least they help you calm your anxiety. So it makes sense to have a physical barrier between you and whatever can approach you if you're, like, if you've got your head in a cave and you can't see what's going on behind you. Yeah, because usually you're diving big brain corals or something, so you're not really in a cave. You're sort of usually on the outside looking in. So yeah. you spent, you're focused on the inside, looking in a lot, so you don't really have a look what's around you. So anything can sort of sneak up on you any time. But even though it's never really, nothing's really bad has happened to me, it's just something I, I tend to do a fair bit. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I was thinking is there, if there's any, if, if they've done it out there, like a, um, a suit maker that will put Kevlar in, because most shark attacks happen around the waistline, the, the leg line. Mm-hmm. So you put Kevlar in, integrated into your suit, so if a shark bites it, it's, it can't bite through, and usually it's it's just a um, love tap trying to figure out what you are most of the time. So I haven't heard the idea of of Kevlar specifically, but I have heard of of, of people having like um, tourniquets, like um, already integrated into the suit around your you, you know your major areas, like yeah. Um, but yeah, like, um, why not? Eh? Why not? Some I'd rather of... I'd rather p- protect than than, than <laughs> prevent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then 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 try and provide a <laughs> yeah first aid. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, well, maybe yeah, like the same sort of material that they use in the safety gloves. Is it is it Kevlar that they use in the, you know, the safety gloves that you use now for filleting and stuff? Yeah, because I got um when I in on my farm when we hand we actually have cut cut proof gloves mm. and they're a very soft malleable material so i don't mm. know how that that should be able to get integrated into a suit as well so yeah, i don't know how hard it will go against a shark a big thump of a shark but it's got to be better than nothing imagine wetsuits in the future we're going to have the we're going to have the hex material we're going to have the <laughs> kevlar weave through it and we're going to uh and we're going to be warm as toast the yeah, shark's going to know what, not know what he bit. Yeah. He ran in here after we didn't see you, didn't, didn't feel you, didn't yeah. taste you. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, and then they'll learn not to do it anymore. Bloody hell, because um, <laughs> when it happens, it, it just happens, eh? And um, talk to a few people that have experienced it and um, it's always, like, un- unexpected and um, yeah. jeepers, um, you wouldn't wish it on anyone. Um mm-hmm. It's the one you don't see is the one that gets you. Yeah, yeah. Usually. Yeah, for sure. Um, all good. Let's have a look at uh, Spiro Q&A. Faster paced round of questions on the way out, Tony. Um, but people can find you, Taz Yarns, now on Instagram. Yeah, Taz Yarns on Instagram and just on um, YouTube as what, well. What are you on YouTube, Taz Yarns? Yeah, Taz Yarns, yeah. And your podcast is? Taz Yarns. Taz Yarns. Yeah. Just Taz Yarns we're going with. Oh, we'll just bring it all into one. Yeah, nice. <laughs> no, I love it. You, you have some funny shit on Instagram too, man. Like, I'm not a big Instagram dude. Like, I'll be honest, I don't like much of the social media stuff. Despite the good things, there are a lot of good things about social media, but yours is always good for a laugh. Um, whether you're farming bananas or talking jiu-jitsu or singing a song or spearfishing, whatever it is. Um, so, Spiro Q&A, um, what's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given, Spearin? Um, Probably... That a contraction's your friend, okay. not your enemy. If you could go back to when you were in your first year of spearing and give yourself some advice, what would you say? Mate, their only contraction settled down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, during your 30 years spearfishing, what's the single biggest lesson you've learned? 
Um, dive with the dive buddy, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much safer. Just, things can change so quickly out there. It's not funny. And yeah, just more. I just think I'm, I'm aiming at North Queensland people because we're all bushies up here and we, we need to change our mindsets up this way. All right, I love it. And uh, last question. Um, if you could describe the spearfishing experience and what it means to you in one sentence, what would you say? An awesome, natural, wonderful world that's there between you and it. Oh, something profound and philosophical. Taz <laughs> Yarns, everyone. Uh, awesome to have you with me, Tony. Um, I'm going to be on Taz Yarns too, I believe, sometime in the future. So check it out anywhere you find good podcasts. Taz Yarns on Instagram. Uh, absolute pl- pleasure, bro. And uh, and I'm hoping to come up there and dive with you one day. So, Mate, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll have to record another podcast then. And talk. I'll have to get it. I can't sell me boat then. Sorry, everyone's not <laughs> sailing anymore. The track's come up. <laughs> Hook our dive boats, everyone. What a fantastic vessel. Buy it at uh, everywhere you buy good boats. <laughs> Thanks, mate. See you later. Jeepers. What what a what a character. Tony Alcock, aka Taz Yarns. Check out his podcast. Like I said earlier, I think my interview with him is going to go live on the same day that this podcast is released. Check it out, Taz Yarns. If you like laid back yarns with, with uh, Aussie characters particularly, check that out. Um, he's a he's a he's a cool dude and I really enjoyed chatting with him. I hope you enjoyed today's interview as well. Next week, that's right. Not even You don't even have to wait two weeks for the next episode. I have got Rachel Thompson and Arissa Zip from West Australia. They are the Life's Short Stay Moist girls. And these girls know how to have a good yarn and a good laugh. It's an absolute frothing interview. Hope you come back and join me um, because I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this chat. Um, As usual, if you love the podcast, please consider becoming a patron. I want to make this show every week, and I will do so with the help of the patron listeners. There's about 45 patron listeners at the moment. Go to patreon.com forward slash noobspiro, and you get to fun trips like the one I'm about to do over to WA and meet a whole bunch of listener legends who have reached out kindly on social media, email, and Facebook and stuff like that. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to diving with the Old Man Blue and the WA Coast. I'm really really looking forward to it so thank you to the patron listeners patreon.com forward slash noob if you're interested in doing it but hey massive massive intro and outro today um but i hope you enjoyed the podcast i'm out Adreno stock all the equipment noobers need for freediving and spearfishing. The Adreno team will help advise you about equipment, diving, trips, dive locations. They can help you with a whole bunch of your spearfishing issues um, and they cater for spearos and aspiring spearos of all levels of experience. You can visit them in store, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth and Sydney and they get a new store on the way. Chat to one of their friendly team members. Don't forget to take advantage of the Noob Spiro discount code. You can save $20 on every purchase over 200 That's right. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200 online at adreno.com.au or in store at one of their mega stores. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by Neptonics.com. Neptonics makes solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on, even when you get all limp biscuit on it. You'll struggle to break stuff. What's up, Shrek? Thanks for everything you do. Love this podcast. I'm relatively new to this sport and am crazy obsessed. And uh, this podcast has been so helpful. Um, Wanted to just tell a quick story, kind of comical. I'm an inlander. I live in Utah. So anytime I get near the ocean, I have to get in that water. And I was in California a couple weeks ago visiting my brother. Conditions weren't great, but you know how it is when you're just hungry to get out there. I kind of forced this dive. We get out there. The surge is bad. Surf's kind of bad. The fish were relatively non-existent. It was bad enough to where you dive down to the bottom and you're clinging on to any rocks you can because the surge is swinging you side to side in any direction, three, four meters. So it was impossible to get a shot. It was probably dangerous, to be honest. Anyway, uh, we were so tired and beat up so quick that we wanted to get out, right? Um, The way that we came in was too far away and we decided to be lazy and get out in a closer spot but this closer spot was not a beach it was a bunch of boulders 
right then a big set comes in. We're already fatigued. You stop, start making stupid decisions at this point, tons of lessons to be learned. And I've learned them so many times in this part of the ocean, but we were tired. We didn't go back to where we should have. We both get picked up by this pretty big wave and slammed on a separate boulder each. It felt like we were a couple of beached mermaids on these rocks. And um, the sad part was my brother lost his brand new Rife mask with his GoPro 8 mounted to it. And uh, man, we were just both so pissed getting out of the water that day. And a lot of lessons we learned. I, every time I take a shortcut, you know, knowing I should have swam back to the actual beach, but didn't because I was tired, I always pay the price in the ocean. So that's probably my biggest lesson to take away from that is that uh, you just don't take uh, shortcuts in the, in the ocean at all, or else it'll almost every time make you pay. Thank you guys for all you do. You guys are awesome. Appreciate this podcast more than you know. Thanks, man.